All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue on with our subject of masonry. Once again, Division 4 corresponds to book chapter 4. This is our third and final part of masonry. Uh, before we talked, we started with the properties of mortar and grout, reinforcement accessories. Then we moved on to the units themselves, um, of clay masonry units and concrete masonry units. Now what we're going to talk about is actually the design and construction of walls. Um, any other masonry applications, stonework, and glass. This corresponds to 4.7 to 4.9 in the textbook for those who are following along. So let's start with just the erection process of uh, unit masonry. And as an overview, uh, what we're going to look at is the, the unit and mortar preparation, getting them ready to be uh, put into our wall. Uh, laying the units, methods to lay the units, the mortar bed, uh, and jointing, and joint finishing, um, and also some flashing. So these are all important uh, aspects to get a watertight, strong, durable wall that'll, that'll look and perform well. When we talk about the moisture content, we touched on this briefly last time, uh, starting with the clay bricks. We said clay bricks, we need a certain saturation level. We can't have the bricks being too porous and suck up too much water, but at the same point they need to be able to suck some of that mortar in to create that bond, right? So we have an ideal saturation content of 5 to 20 grams of water per minute. Uh, if they're too dry, they will suck that water out of the mortar. Uh, and if it's too wet, then we won't get the good bond. So what we can do is we can put just a little bit of water on that clay brick and if it absorbs in uh, fairly quickly, less than a minute, then they're too dry and we have to sprinkle some water on there uh, or wet them down before we put on our mortar. The CMUs on the other hand uh, don't need to be wetted, never should be wetted. Uh, they, they don't absorb the water and if anything we don't want the water in there because we want the mortar to get up into all of those voids and the water would would fill up some of those voids so uh, cmu's never wet uh, clay bricks you may need to wet before you start the wall building process so when we look at our clay uh, masonry units uh, there is some terminology we should be familiar with and it's all based on what direction the brick is laying Unfortunately, I don't have a brick with me, so hopefully these pictures will work. But um, so for this header course, you can imagine they're they're put uh, so the shallow side is down, long ways back against the wall. Uh, this front part is the part that would actually be exposed. Um, and I gave you two different photos. I think some might help better than others. So this one, the shaded parts, the part you actually see on the front of the wall. We also have a stretcher, uh, where this is probably the most common uh, way you tend to think about seeing these, laying flat. Uh, this is the side we see on the wall. We have a row lock, and a row lock, we're putting them up on end and putting them together. So here's our row lock. You can see they're, they're taller than they are wide. Um, the part that we would see is this, this side over here. We have this shiner course, which is basically just like a stretcher course, but turned on end. This one doesn't actually have a picture of that one. We have a soldier. So a, a soldier and sailor are both putting our bricks up on end. So they're the tallest direction. It's just a matter of are you putting the skinnier side facing out or the wider side facing out. So sailor is that wider side facing out. Soldier is that skinnier side facing out. And of course, however you decide on this uh, or whatever is required for this uh, type of placement will dictate what the, the looks like as far as the pattern bond, right? We talked about pattern bonds a little bit last time. So here's an example. We have two widths. We talked about widths last time. It's basically we have two walls going up, uh, one here, one here, and then we're connecting them every once in a while with like a header. And that header is tying them together, giving us that mechanical bond between those two widths. And then also note we have a roll lock up here. So we said the roll locks when we turn them up on end, and it's also giving us this bond between them. Uh, this is especially true if we have uh, bricks with our, with our cores or our holes in them, right? Because with this header, we would still see those holes. Uh, however, with the roll lock, when I turn them up like this, our holes are now 
covered. Of course, you never want to want your uh, holes to be exposed or your cores to be exposed, right? So when you're looking at building the CMU wall, some considerations you want to take into place is laying the course for spacing without mortar. So this is a key first step. Put all of your bricks there. Make sure everything's going to work out before you do the mortar, before it's too late, right? Uh, then you're going to start with your corners and you plumb both your corners or all of your corners. Uh, plumb, of course, means your, your alignment vertical then also level so horizontal right getting it uh, both vertically aligned horizontally aligned plumb and level uh, you want to think about the thickness of your mortar joints of course that'll dictate uh, the width of your wall uh, the consistency of the mortar beds because you don't want it too thin uh, so it'll just run out you don't want it too thick where it isn't workable and also the joint tooling which we'll talk about in a little bit but basically finishing out all of these joints so let's talk about the general process. These are some pictures from the 60s. I tried finding some newer, better stuff. I don't know if they're from the 60s. They just look old, right? But I tried to find some newer, better pictures, but I like these as far as the, the general process. But So in essence, we're laying the first course on this full, meta, full mortar bed. And this does show an example of laying it out before you place your mortar. Uh, then you actually start at your corners uh and you're working your way up on your corners uh and this is called a, a story pole basically a story pole has your marks for each uh, height that you're going to have to make sure that you're you're you know you're on site and you're staying with your heights that you need to be basically um saving you or making sure that you have all your grout lines the consistent height so after the two corners you can see he's running this line in order to get a reference height make sure the same height as he finishes up these inner courses towards the center of the wall, right? Always checking for levelness and plumb. This is plumb, there's level. And after we're done, we're tooling the joints. So basically using this tool to get that nice round contour. Uh, and it does say, actually it doesn't say, but it is a consistency where if you put your thumbprint in there, it wouldn't actually leave much of an indentation, but it's still soft. Uh, and then the final step would be to clean off any extra mortar that was squirted out during this process with this stiff brush, right? There is a short YouTube video uh, that shows this process. So you can see that in this video they're laying it out without any mortar in the beginning to make sure your distances are going to be good. Uh, there they're talking a little bit about the footing. Uh, so don't care about that so much. We talked about footings already. So this is a check of your consistency and what they're saying is you should be able to hold your trowel sideways and if it's the right consistency you see it will stick to the side of that trowel. Laying out that base course. This is called buttering, putting that little bit on the edges because as we put these bricks together end to end we need to make sure that we have make sure we have mortar there as well. There's our reference line, make sure our heights are the same as we fill in the center. And there we're tooling our joints to get that uh, nice smooth line uh, to repel the water out. Then as a final step, we can see we're grouting uh, the inside of those cavities and finishing it off. Let's head back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so looking at drawings, we can see some details as far as connecting. Um, in this case, we have a pretty large uh, beam that we're connecting to our CMU wall and in real life this is what it would look like. So we have our CMU wall, of course these were cast into that that grout, grouted into place, right? And here we see those beams. Now these beams, you can see the holes right over here, those of course would go right over those guys and see how they're slotted. We talked a little bit about connections before, that means it's a slip critical, it means what we're concerned with is just the force uh, pulling the units together to create that connection. Here's a couple other holes and that's what we're connecting to those, how we're connecting the CMU wall to our beams for the structure. <clears throat> Here we're looking at the uh, grouting process. So we have a truck uh, pouring this grout into a pumper. See this hose coming over here. You can see the consistency is a little bit lighter than concrete. Definitely less of a um, of a lesser sized aggregate, a smaller aggregate to fit in all the voids. Here we can see uh, someone working on top of the scaffolding on the top of our wall. 
uh, and there they're pumping that grout into those voids. More of that process where you can see the grout filling in. You can see it's a very liquid consistency. And there it looks like from the top we can see how it's all getting filled in. Here's a picture showing more of the structural system with the rebar. Some kind of tie-in. Uh, so that would mean that this is probably not the exterior face, but instead there'll be maybe like a brick or something else that's more aesthetically pleasing than the CMU wall. Most don't seem to find that really attractive. And here we see the wall, uh, CMU wall finished. A couple things to note. One, we do have our expansion joints. We talked about that last time. We have these uh, adjustable tilt-up braces. The way these braces work is it's just keeping it in place until we get the rest of the structure, which will eventually hold it into place. Then those will be removed. So let's move over to our clay bricks and how to build a clay brick wall. Same idea. We're laying our first course without the mortar to check the layout. Uh, then we're, we're setting a brick and mortar on each end and then running that chalk line, that level line to figure out to get our heights correct, right? Uh, several courses on the end before we fill in the middle. Uh, and just like before with these kind of archaic pictures, to get some terminology here, the first thing we want to do is lay a trowel of mortar on top of the bricks and we're tilting our trowel sideways um, and creating a windrow of mortar along the row of bricks. The windrow is that uh, kind of a triangular shape right on top of the bricks, right? We're going to spread that over a few bricks, uh, then cut off the ends that are the, the mortar that is squirting off the sides. Just cut those and put it back on further down the brick line. Uh, then we're going to create a furrow. So basically we start off with that triangle shape and then we're taking our trowel and making this little furrow in the top of the bricks. Finally, we're placing our bricks. Uh, we do need to put some mortar on the head of the, the brick so that they will, they will, it'll make sure that there's mortar at this joint between those two bricks there. So that's what I, that's what I was calling buttering before, another term. So I had this video uh, before when I first introduced the topic, but now that we know these terms, I can see that he starts with that wood row, then he's doing the uh, furrow right there, right? Uh, this is that introductory course. Let's go to something a little more interesting here. So there it is with the putting the, the windrow on top of the bricks, that more triangular shape. There he's doing his furrow. He's cutting the sides. He's putting his brick on there. He did already have it back buttered, putting that on there as well. And cleaning off the sides, cleaning off the joints, and repeating the process. So you can watch more of that video on your own time. Let's go back to that PowerPoint. All right, so some other considerations when, when putting up these uh, clay masonry walls. One is that we can only reposition, reposition the bricks while the mortar is still plastic, right? So while once the mortar sets up, of course we're not going to be able to uh, reposition. So as you're working your way up the wall, Hopefully you discover any abnormalities soon enough where you can tap them into place. Uh, and it's usually that's how they do it. There's this light little tapping, right? Otherwise you might hurt the bond. Uh, you can see this mason pulled up the brick to check the bond. I can see that mortar is sticking to the brick. That's what we would want. As far as the joints between our blocks, uh, they can either be troweled or tooled. Troweled meaning you're using your trowel that we've been using all along to make the shape, to, to make the shape within the, uh, in between the blocks on the, on the mortar, right? Tooled is using some, one of these tools here uh, to create our shape. And the biggest thing that we're concerned with, at least on exterior applications, is the fact that we need to create a place for the water to run off and not accumulate within our joints. We can see these different terminology. We have a concave, a V. Uh, those are both tooled. And then for troweled, if I'm only using my trowel, there's only so much I can do with the pointy end of that, but I could create this weathered, where I'm drawing it back. Flush, where I just keep it all flush with the bricks. Struck, which is basically the opposite of weathered, going in on the brick. And then raked, where I just put my trowel inside and I'm putting the whole joint uh, square on the inside, right? So this is the key. Any joint that leaves a shelf-like area will allow moisture to collect. So I can imagine moisture collecting right there on that struck or on the raked right there as well, right? 
Uh, concave hopefully would run out and same thing with this V shape. And we'll see more of those in, in, in the next slide. Uh, there is a, a video if you want to watch the process and, and some advantages and disadvantages of these types of joints as well. But if we're just going to talk about it, um, so these are your joints shown by performance level. Now performance meaning to keep that water away and also a little bit with aesthetics, right? So we have this concave, you can imagine water coming down, it would not accumulate or run right out, so that's good. Flush is fair, but you still have water that could stick right here to the side. Flush and rotted is fair, but you could get water accumulating right there. V-joint is good uh, for the same reason as concave. Weathered is good, uh, and this is with the trowel, remember. So your water is coming down, it would not accumulate, it would just run off. However, struck is, is bad because you think about water coming down here and collecting right there. Same thing with raked. Um, ruled is fair. Now this is just ugly, right? Uh, so that's extruded, kind of just sticking out the sides. And then a bead, anything that's sticking out, protruding from the wall would be bad as far as accumulating water and weathering. So you may have some of these other ones that are, raked, uh, that are rated as poor as like an interior surface or something not exposed to the elements. But in general, they aren't good for that water repelling. Speaking of keeping water out, we also have flashing. Uh, so we have it at many places uh, within this wall. We have it at the base of walls. So I see my flashing down here. Under the sills of wall openings, so if I have an opening right here, I need a sill, or sorry, a flashing underneath that sill. Uh, and then on the top up here, I need more flashing. Uh, and remember what flashing is doing is just allowing water to escape, to, to get the water out of the wall from accumulating, right? Uh, we also have flashing where uh, the masonry penetrates the roof. So here's the roof, and here we have some flashing. We have a cap flashing. So you can imagine water coming here and it hits this flashing, it, it isn't going to suck back up in, so it would come over here, hit this one, and then be whisked away, right? And that's really what we're talking about with this flashing, is just trying to keep the water away, giving it ways to get away from our building. Uh, it's often made of uh, sheet metal or plastic. I always think sheet metal is the most common, but it could be plastic. As far as keeping water out, we can also use this idea of parging. And what parging is, is, um, is basically putting a layer on top of our wall. So if I have a CMU wall like this, and then I put this, um, this in essence, plaster that's made out of either type, one, type M mortar or Portland. So remember, type M mortar is the strongest type of mortar. It's, it's closest to what a Portland cement would be like. Um, and you're basically just coating it and creating this, tr this troweled smooth surface to penetrate water. You can also damp proof it, which is a bituminous uh, coat almost like a tar coating over the whole surface and you can either do that directly on the masonry or on top of your parging right now don't confuse these with just preventing groundwater from entering below a grade wall meaning if I have uh, groundwater that's so high and it's just sitting against the surface that's not the purpose of this parging and damp proofing it's really a matter of just having water come on and then shed it. But if it's, if it's in essence soaking in water, if it's below water table, then these methods probably aren't gonna be good enough. So uh, of course, if you don't finish your job in one day, you'd have to protect your work and uh, you could cover it with some kind of um, uh, covering, uh, extending on the sides, keeping the water out. Also cold weather, same issue that we talked about with concrete. It slows that hydration process, right? That chemical reaction that's going on, in this case, with your mortar. So if it's below 40 degrees, then we need to protect it by putting, well, the same methods we talked about before, where we can tarp it, heat it, something else to try and keep that, that heat uh, while this um, hydration process is taking place. So pointing and cleaning. Pointing is going back, and if, if you were to look closely at the, at the mortar, you might have some holes or gaps where uh, some of the mortar either squeezed out or something. Well, we have to fill in those holes and gaps. We call that pointing. Uh, we also have this idea of cleaning it off, right? Using a stiff brush and clean water to get all that excess mortar that's on the side of the bricks off. Uh, or you can use a mild acid solution or you can even pressure washer it off. Of course, be careful with those types of methods because you could over pressure wash, especially if it's too green, if it's been done too soon, and you could actually heart hurt. You could you could hurt the uh, the mortar itself. So you can see this type of some of these notes on the project manual. 
uh, talking about uh, compressive strength that we might need or how much water we can have being absorbed. We talked about that before. The size of our bricks, this is a standard size brick dimension. We talked about that already. Talking about curing, uh, we talked about a little bit about curing bricks last time. The Portland cement type to, to be used. Uh, type three, that high early strength. Uh, if you have cold weather, should make sense, right? Uh, we talked about uh, type of type of mortar. This is a type N below grade, and we said before type N should be used below grade. So you see all the same stuff that we've talked about within the project manual. We should have a high slump of eight to eleven inches with this grout. Remember, we're using this pumper, and we're in a very fluid consistency to that grout. Uh, there's that, brick, that brick wetting we talked about. Uh, if we have an initial rate that exceeds 30 grams of water per 30 square inch, then we do need to wet the brick because it's sucking too much water out, right? So some other types of uh, application, masonry applications that we haven't really discussed much. We aren't really going to spend too much time on it because it's very, it's, it's, it's not used near as much. would be stone and glass. Uh, when we talk about stone, definitely more architectural, field stone, rubble, flagstone, dimension, cut, ashlar, crush, stone river, plenty of different types of, of stones. Uh, this building, if you haven't seen this, this is, uh, where is it? I think that's off of uh, College near Prospect, right? And you can see the use of this flagstone throughout, uh, both along this front part here and then also up the sides. Uh, we have some other stone surfaces here we can see what that looks like less uniform uh, more aesthetic been used forever we can also have glass so these are basically glass blocks and uh, installed similar to these stone systems can be either interior or exterior uh, can have cavities we can talk about multiple layers with a cavity in between or be solid um, use a type s mortar when you're using your your glass block and this glass does come in a variety of colors or, you know, it's usually used in a place where you want light to come in, right? So um, University of Colorado Denver has a whole side of their building made out of this glass block. So interesting stuff. So that's what I have for this presentation. Uh, and this wraps up everything for not only for masonry, but also for the topics we're going to cover before exam number two. So uh, look for an exam review next time. And as always, uh, give me a shout out if you have any questions, comments, concerns, and I'll talk to you all later. Thanks.